We are going to start this morning with the Irish Daily Mail. Rocky victory. McCarthy says Gibraltar win was a horrible game. It's not wrong there. Uh, and Thrones McCann to learn suspension fate, says Michal Clifford here. So um, this is a situation where Tierney McCann may only get a one-game ban. I think Colin McKees has it in the Irish Independent. So that'll be interesting to see what the reaction to that is like. And also, as you can see on the top of uh, the back page here, has TJ Reid dethroned King Henry? Philip Lanigan's column this morning is very interesting. We might come back to that in a little while. As the greatest of all time? As... It as well, like, I, I'm not the the term "goat" isn't mentioned in the piece, but it's just a direct comparison between TJ and between Henry Shefflin. Um, it's it just basically asking the question: Is he better than Henry Shefflin? So, if you believe Henry is the greatest of all time, then yes, this, that is exactly what Philip Flanagan is asking. He talks about uh, the tough apprenticeship that he went through, the uh, less amazing teammates that TJ Reid has had to share a pitch with, and just the uh, unbelievable performances that he's put in, sometimes uh, against the grain. He makes a comparison between TJ Reid in this summer's championship and Maradona in the 1986 World Cup. Yeah, Maradona did have Val Jorge Valdano playing with him, but maybe uh, Richie Hogan can play the Jorge Valdano role. Uh, okay, so the examiner this morning is rock and roll, lacklustre Ireland, grind out win over Gibraltar. Uh, game changer Barrister and refing into a search for perfection. I don't know if everybody's actually just overreacting to Byron. Maybe we'll all settle down in 18 months now. We'll forget about all this. Uh, all Ireland qualifiers, Monaghan and Armagh set for clone to stay clone. Um, Fogarty Forum, Hurling is not ready to tackle cynicism scourge. Uh, and Bench ready, McElroy, sorry, Beach ready, McElroy heads to Pebble, pumped and primed. Interesting column, as ever, from Michal Quirk. Mike Quirk, when players are so disciplined off the field, why do they lose control on it? And uh, if you weren't sure, you just flick to the page and you see Tiernan McCann getting his fingers right in there. And a one game ban. Supposedly, we're going to know a lot more this afternoon, I think. His thumb is in the mouth there, isn't it? Like, you can, is that, like, or is it, is it down here? So, is, uh, it, is, it, is, it, is it just. Not? Like, I, I would definitely suggest it's in the mouth. And uh, beyond that, it's up to you. There has been some suggestion that Stephen McManaman couldn't see after the particular challenge. Carl Lacey was on the record of saying that yesterday. Yeah, so Carl Lacey says um, he was sore when it happened. There was a possibility he might have been taken off. The site was gone for a wee bit. But he's a tough boy. I don't know about it, the video footage. I didn't know about it until the way home. I didn't see it at the time. We have other things to worry about. We let the GA deal with that. <laughs> well, like, we, we will see. It's... Uh, it is a rather kind of grey area, isn't it, that we're getting into here. Clearly the hand is in the face, clearly we can see the, the foot going to the head. Did the hand wander towards the eye? Is that the difference between a full summer ban and a one game ban? But is the foot in the head not enough for a full summer ban? Well, that's, that's my point here. It's like, does, is that grey area we're all lingering in and kind of tiptoeing around over the last couple of days? Uh, like, we can't call it a gouge because, you know, gouge suggests the eye. But you can call it a fish hook because clearly his finger's in his mouth. But maybe you can call it a gouge because maybe his finger was in the eye. Yeah. And that is the thing we're kind of flirting with. But maybe it doesn't make a difference. I think that. Um there just needs to be a tightening up of the rule book. Any contact with the face area should be an automatic three game ban. And then if you do a little bit of digging around, if you don't have a little feel around, you know, if you're just testing the texture of the eyeball, seeing if it's as jelly as it looks, then that should be like a year ban, right? Yeah, like, I mean, I... Fish hook should be like, <laughs> you should be um, thirstied through the streets of whatever small town and village and everybody can come and throw shit at you. I mean, literal human feces. What, have you ever had the urge to uh, fish hook somebody? No, not yet. One day. It's, a, it's an early morning, yeah. Uh, the back page of the Herald is Coleman saying we must do better. Ireland captain relieved after a narrow win over Gibraltar. Dave McGoldrick there smiling, uh, kind of in relief after he thought he'd scored his first international goal. I'm not sure that he even fully believe it at the time, but it was an own goal. And also death, taxes and Cluxton. There are now three certainties in life. Hey, uh, front page of the Irish Independent. Got to bring you this because it is uh, another FAI story. High profile FAI salary details at risk in email hack. Um, there are fears that the salary and bank account details of John Delaney, Mick McCarthy and other leading FAI employees and officials may have been compromised by the cyber attack on the Troubled Association. <laughs> FAI staff have been warned in an internal memo seen by the Irish Independent that bank account and PPS details could have been accessed during the hacking of the association's email servers. And um, they've been told if you work for the FAI, monitor your account just in case somebody gets their hands on it. 
The sun this morning goes with I'm off on holiday, mix over and out after going five points clear. Will he bring us back a lick of rock, says uh, Robbie Brady then in terms of uh, the back page there. Well, oh, because he's got a tongue out. Mm -hmm. And uh, rock. there's a rock in Gibraltar apparently. Uh, the one Ole wants, uh, determined Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is ready to up his offer for Aaron Wan-Bissaka to £50 million. What was it yesterday? 35? 40, I don't know. 25? It's short of the 65 they asked for, right? Yeah. So it's... Oh yeah, sorry, here it is. United saw their 35 million quid bid KO by Crystal Palace. So if you've gone from 35 million to 50 million quid in the space of 24 hours, a good negotiator, now I'm, I know I'm sticking my neck out here, may feel that they could get even more than that. From if you've gone up by 15 million quid in 24 hours, you might even be able to get your full 65 million Crystal Palace. And this whole idea that you know, Manchester United have changed their entire structure based on the idea that they signed Daniel James for, you know, chips uh, that, that we might reflect upon. Um, it seems that they haven't actually done so. And Blue must get top four, says Andrew Dillon. Chelsea will demand a top four finish from their new boss, even with a transfer ban and the loss of star man Eden Hazard, Frank Lampard, the front runner to get the Chelsea gig. Right. The uh, Irish Times, Sports Tuesday, Gavin Komsky has the job of doing the player ratings, uh, Emma Malone has the match report, and um, I'd love to have turned everybody on with some sexy football, says Big Mick, but, well, we didn't. Uh, OFI surprised by European Games invite for Hickey. European Olympic Committee continues to stand behind its former president. So, uh, last week's news that the former president of the Olympic Council of Ireland, now Olympic Federation of Ireland, OFI, Pat Hickey, was invited to the European Games in Minsk was not something the OFI saw coming. I guess if your buddy's in trouble, you've got to stand by your buddy. That's how life works. That's what good buddies are. You can't uh, not buddy up with somebody after they've been your buddy for so long, really. No, exactly. It'd be <laughs> rule number one of life. It'd be a bad thing to do. Um, and uh, Kevin McStay, um, the qualifiers are light years ahead of the alternative. We're going to talk about this with, uh, with Tommy Rooney. The qualifiers, I mean... Are they like years ahead of the alternative? Is the alternative the past or is the alternative the future? Because we can all imagine the better future, so... I don't know. I think qualifiers are rubbish. Well, they're certainly better, they're certainly better than the, the alternative of the past, but I presume he's talking about the alternative of the future, which would be potentially a, a two-tier championship. Like, for me, when I saw Fermanagh get knocked out of the championship at the weekend, I'm not going to lie, I thought to myself, good riddance. Good luck to you, Fermana. But then I thought about it for a second. I was like, how unfair is it that you know they put in a brilliant, by their standards, brilliant league campaign, conceded the least amongst all four divisions? I disagree with how they play, but fair enough to them, and good luck to them for planning, preparing, all that. So that's supposed to be your foundation for the summer ahead. Then they draw Donegal and Ulster, and it's a game they're expected to lose, and they do lose. Round one of the qualifiers, they draw Monaghan. It's a game they're expected to lose, and they do lose, and that's it. They're finished. Like, that's it. The wages of sin or death, and you're happy about that. And, like, to be fair, as I say, it's like, I don't enjoy watching them play. I enjoyed seeing uh, Donegal unlock them in that game in Ulster. Uh, but still, you can see the injustice. Um, a quick 5 out of 10 for Shane Duffy. Comparisons <coughs> to Richard Dunn, never mind Paul McGrath, are premature. Highlight was passing the ball out of play on 18 minutes. Couldn't get the noggin to Horhan's poor corners. Uh, so Gavin Comiskey not not sparing the rod, channeling his inner league keep this morning. It, Gavin Comiskey is my favourite player writer uh, in any of the newspapers, really. Uh, in ter like, I'm not sure who's doing uh, well in his ratings, but it seems Callum Robinson is the man who's stood out for most player writers, uh, as you can probably imagine. Although um, Dan McDonald didn't even go for an Irishman, but his man of the match. Um, <laughs> Connor Howard and Jeff Hendry getting fives here in the mirror. Shane Duffy did get a six, Enda Stevens getting a five. Like, I've picked a bad morning, I'll accept, to try and defend Enda Stevens. Like, it was, uh, it was, it was opportunistic from you, for sure, to, to go for the Matt Doherty, should be in at left back take. I'd try it. Or try Coleman at left back. Like, he's a really classy footballer, he could easily do it. He could be brilliant at it. I'd be interested to see that. Dennis Irwin was like, oh, you know, we've got a really good right back now. How about you play left back? Yeah, no problems. And was excellent. Always excellent. I, I would be interested to see Seamus Coleman at left back, see how he does. And uh, see if Adrian Barry would give him a higher rate. I'd, li I'd like to see Adrian's take on uh, Seamus Coleman last night, actually. Uh, the mirror this morning, tab of the morning to you. Damp jib, no fireworks from Ireland, but Mick's just happy to be five clear at the top. And Stephen Sight was gone for a period. This is Carl Lacey, who was doing the rounds in the media yesterday. He said he was sore when it happened. This is Mac Meneman after the incident with Tiernan McCann. There was a possibility he might have been taken off. The Sight was gone for a wee bit, but he's a tough boy. I think he was a wee bit blurry in his vision. That was the feedback which is interesting stuff from Carol Acey, who, uh, who's obviously been speaking uh, to Mac Menemann or somebody close to Mac Menemann in the camp. 
The Racing Post, uh, Yates, 10 years on, how the staying legend made history in the Gold Cup and Turner Ascot breakthrough for female riders in a matter of time and then also a picture of Aidan O'Brien. Uh, Bookies fear Ascot drubbing at hands of O'Brien and Moore. So obviously Ryan Moore alongside him as well. So. Uh, final newspaper for me then is the Irish Daily Star. Bumpy ride, traffic problems hold up Ireland, but it's a perfect 10 for McCarthy. We do have to say, yo, give Mick McCarthy the huge benefit of the doubt here. We all know what happened last time a bus got delayed in a significant moment of Irish sport. They ended up losing a Murrayfield. Could have lost to Gibraltar last night because of the bus. I mean, we, so, could, have lost, we could have lost to Gibraltar, right? Or certainly Gibraltar could have equalised. Yeah, we kind of forget as well that we could have lost to Gibraltar in Gibraltar. Like, the, uh, the, the save of the group so far there, say, I haven't watched too many of the other games that haven't involved Ireland, was Darren Randolph against Gibraltar. Yeah. So, like, we've got ourselves into a situation where we've been highly unimpressive against them, but at the same time kind of saving our bacon through uh, a pretty significant save in the Gibraltar game. Uh, we're going to get uh, Tommy Rooney in in just a moment uh, to chat about his column uh, about how the Gaelic Football uh, Championship is going to be tough to save. Uh, and perhaps we should just kind of uh, save the, the debt rights now. Uh, opinion, is it too late to save football? The players and the fans of Gaelic football are being cheated by the championship. An empty Croke Park on Sunday testified to the fact that the fans are sick of it. If you haven't seen this, uh, it's on offtheball.com. One of the things that stuck out to me, it's something that a lot of people will know, but Tommy puts it into cold figures here. There have been 35 games in the All-Ireland Championship so far this summer. In 19 of those games, the difference has been six points or more. In 13 of those games, the difference has been in double digits. Uh, how do you fix the life? Like, this is all basically in the context of us kind of celebrating the Ulster Championship and some other games that have been excellent outside the Ulster Championship. Look at the league. Now, this is the key point. In 116 games across the 2019 leagues this spring, just five games ended with a difference in the double digits. Now that's competition, that's worth watching. It's a monumental difference between the results we're seeing in the Championship. How are you, Tommy? Good morning, lads. How are we? So you were in the library that was Crow Park on Sunday? It was, it was in the Lower Hogan stand. You Good. can look over to the Cusack and you can pick out a mate and have a chat. <laughs> look across to the hill and pick out the three or four me boys that were causing a bit of, causing a bit of hassle. Can you hear all the calls during both games? Oh, in the first game you could hear everything. You could, you could hear Graham Brody. Uh, Chatting, chatting to his defenders and roaring stuff out the pitch. You could hear the players saying stuff. Yeah, you could, you could. It was, it was, it was. As, I've been to a lot of bad sporting events that have been Leinster semi-finals. The worst probably being Westmead's comeback against me. Do you know that collapse? But like really bad events. I mean, in terms of like atmosphere. But that was the worst. Like that was. Is the Leinster so football bad. championship the worst sporting competition in the world, or the worst one that we kind of interact with or, or watch with? I can't think of a, a worse one. Maybe the basketball in the Olympics when the Dream Team were playing. To Fairly similar, isn't it? It's like yeah, pretty bad. All of these games are largely irrelevant. Although at least there are some other world-class athletes mm -hmm. playing in that. The the best footballer in Leinster outside of Dublin is uh, not playing in the competition. At the yeah, moment. and like there, there does throw up some good games. Like Longford Calair, the first game was a brilliant game. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say if Mead were playing West Mead at the weekend, like if Le if Leash had had lost to West Mead, um, I think it would have been a better game in terms of rivalry. Um, like I don't think Leash are a bad team like a promoter from Division 3 but there was one stage in the second half where Donny Kingston had a free and standing beside him was Brandon Quigley who had just come on Ross Munley had just come on for Leash and John O'Loughlin was there as well and you're thinking that's all they really have at the minute so like Mead kind of swatted them aside in two 10 minute spells but like Mead's problem was they stooped down to Leash's level at the start like they ran out of play with the ball twice they were dropping ball kicking balls over the end line and they only kicked into gear after Leash got a couple of points your, minutes into the game. Your point about that, though, is that the, one of the reasons why Meads took to Leash's level is not because Leash dragged him down, it's because the atmosphere is so dead that it feels like this is training. Yeah, not, well, not even a challenge, just training. And I, like, that, that's kind of what I felt. So I was sitting quite low on Hogan, um, looking at the pitch, and I was like, how can you get yourself up for championship football here? When you're, It must be surreal, looking around the stadium and seeing all the empty seats. Now, obviously, you're not looking around the stadium, because I've played in games before with an empty, empty stadium. You're not looking, you don't know what's going on outside you. But there must be a feeling that, what has gone on here? And funnily enough, Kevin Feely, I hadn't read it at the time, but Kevin Feely was speaking to the examiner Saturday about it, um, how it feels like it's less than training. It's, it's just dead. And that Calair have had problems with that before, and that they've had to work on not letting that affect them in a the game, but it must affect you. And looking at the pace of that Mead Leash game at the start, there wasn't a championship pace to that game. Like Brian Menton brought a bit of zip and scored a goal twice. He just he just upped the game by fifteen percent in and Mead just took over for two ten minute spells and that was all they needed. But like it's not doing anyone any good. Like you're paying in to watch championship football. You want to see a bit of blood and guts and a bit of 
I don't know, a bit of fire, and it just wasn't there at all. What was the roar from the hill like when Dublin ran out? The, the loudest roar from the hill all day was when Stephen Cluxon put that ball over the bar in the 2011 All-Ireland Final, from that montage. Like, that was it, like, they didn't. <laughs> they, like, I, I was sitting beside a couple of dubs and, um, in the first half, and it was just like, they were roaring, and they turned around to me at one stage, and they were like, they thought I was a Galair man, because I was roaring for Galair, obviously. And they were like, uh, <laughs> you should have scored a goal there. And I kind of showed down my, my meat top, and I went, no, I'm, I'm shouting for, for, uh, for anyone but Dublin here. And uh, I was like, you guys must be sick of it. And he said he wasn't like, but I didn't believe him. Like, they I must be sick of it. Like. I don't think they are. I mean, have to be sick of it. But Look, you're nobody turned up, sure. You're a Man United fan. You know exactly what it's like. You had, you, <coughs> you had all your teenage years where it was anointed at the start of the year that you were going to win the league, more than likely. And it, you loved every second of it. Well, I didn't. I used to love a Man United when 1-0 down when I was younger. <laughs> they knew they were going to win. Like. <laughs> well, they never went unbeaten. Like, Brian Fenton's yeah. never lost a championship game. These are, these are the, the standards we're talking about here. It's like, I, I often try and put myself in those shoes as well. What would it be like? Mm. I, I do think, though, <clears> that uh, I saw loads of people from um, Kildare giving out that it's not their fault that people aren't showing up. But it is, it is on Kildare and me that they've not got the best of their respective resources over the last decade, that they fell so far behind. Think, think me that made them come back, right? Think of what Kildare have had. Like, Kildare have had very good teams. And they were very unlucky in 2011 when Kevin Cassidy put that ball over the bar. Not since like, geezer, though. But it could have changed. And like, but they've been very unlucky. They've had so many professionals that have gone to play AFL football. And they've come back now. Yeah. Like, there is obviously things going wrong. There must be things going wrong in Kildare at the minute. But well, like, uh, they do have footballers there. It's just the gulf is so far apart. Yeah, but... Like, you're at halftime, it was 11-7. Okay, and you're you're looking at that scoreline. I don't think Kildare uh, have done everything to maximise their resources. Is my point. I don't think Meath have done everything. No, they Meath, Meath have got things more right than wrong in the last couple of years. But you still say that there are footballers in Meath who should be playing who aren't playing, and that's that's a, that's a different conversation. Like you guys are going to have Ron O'Neill on later on as well. Like that's a different conversation. Like when I look at Meath and I look at how we're going to match up against Dublin, like obviously you're always going to think, okay, obviously there's going to be you might you might get a chance if something happens. But like when you look at it man for man, like Meath are missing the likes of. Lads like, say, Harry Rooney and Ronan Jones and even Bryn Conlon, who are boys that are in profile six foot two or six foot one and they're a bit bigger. Like, that's what Mead are missing. Like, Kildare had that the other day and they turned over Dublin an awful lot in the first half. They turned them over so many... Like, Michael Darren McCauley lost the ball so many times to running down blind alleys in the first half. Peter Kelly had Conor Collin on his arse twice. And you're thinking, Kildare were in this. And then you go to yourself, actually, they're not. The second Dublin switch it on a gear or bring it up a gear, it's game over. And that's what happened. Okay, so are we saying that it is entirely Dublin's fault and that, uh, you know, nothing can be done to fix this? Or should these two other teams just be at the top end of Division 2 trying to get into Division 1? The thing here is, like, Dublin, you can't blame Dublin for what they've done. Oh. Like, you, you can't actually be too critical about the current management and the players because they have no blame in this whatsoever. Like just, on, goal, yeah. just on your point on, on Kildare, Meath, like you look at Dublin and what they did, say, even as recent as 10 years ago, because you look at whatever, 2000, 2001, when the structure started to come into place, with finances, all that sort of thing that allowed Dublin to move forward. It still took them a while for them to get that right. There was a bit of mismanagement with their senior inter-county team and perhaps at different levels as well. Is that level of mismanagement going on in Meath and Kildare? at the moment, hasn't been going on for the last five or ten years. Like The population numbers are there. Well, like, so the, the why are, why are Mayo? Is there. Andy McInerney's done a brilliant <coughs> job this year. Like, Mead are in Division mm. 1. If Mead get to the Super 8, the progression this year will be beyond anything they've achieved in the last decade. Like, for sure. It's so much. Like, like, prior to this year. Well, McInerney's been building towards this for a couple of years. You need to give a, a manager a, couple, a bit of time. And he's actually built a team that really suits the way he wants to play football. I just think they're missing maybe two big big men in, in, on the pitch lock. That's, that's really what I think Mead are missing. I think they're really, really good um, breaking from the fence. They're really good going through the hands. They've got some really sharp forwards inside. They're just missing another man in midfield or another two men in midfield around the half forward line. That's it, Lock. I think Monaghan and Mayo are, have been different styles of templates for what every inter-county team should be aspiring to be. And I don't think Kildare have hit that level since McGinley left. And I'm not sure that the rest of the structures in the county board... Obviously, underage football is going well, but we're not seeing enough of those young players um, coming through. And we're not seeing the best player in the county play for the county at the moment. So You're not seeing Jimmy Island either. Why is that? I don't know. I, like, even if he's not up to it yet, give him the game time. Let him experience that. Like, unless they're protecting him for this run through the qualifiers or something. I don't know. It didn't make any sense to me. But like, if Clare get to the Super 8s, 
and they break into an All Ireland semi final. This year has been a success. Yeah, but the, I that's mean, not that's like look, but look at the profile of players that they have. Like I, I, it, that's exactly what they should be aiming for, <coughs> and so I think that team should have been able to put it up to Dublin for much longer than they did, and there should have been some tactical variation that you're going, okay, well, that, that's what you, that, you shot your shot, and that was your shot, as opposed to what we saw at the weekend. Like, I heard a lot of Kildare people say <coughs> after the game, um, gee, that wasn't bad, like, we, we actually, they didn't concede a goal, I know it was 15 points at the end, like, but, like, if Ben McCormick had taken one of his goal chances, or Cluxon had made, made that brilliant save and Keith Cribben, you know, it looks a lot better. But the thing is, Dublin were at a challenge match though. pace. Yeah. They really were. Paul and Mannion like, was class in the first 10 minutes. The Dubs must be bored of that, playing in that arena as well. They have to, not in the arena, but like at that pace. Uh, that in, in that arena when there's 30,000 people and I'm sure 5,000 yeah. people are left. Let, let's pretend that, say, uh, Kieran Donaghy's championship structure is the reality now. How many of the Dublin games would be competitive? Because Kildare got to the Super 8s last year. Kildare are Division 2 side. Are Kildare playing, are Dublin playing Kildare in Newbridge? In Newbridge, like that's, that's the difference. Competitive, so that's so. The, like, that is obviously a key point. I think they're away games and it depends on who their home games are against. If their home games are against bad teams, then they're going to win them. And that, but that's fair enough. And at least at the end of the seven or eight games, then you've got enough video evidence on all of the players to go, well, this guy's actually got a weakness here. This is their team weakness. That full back line that we've seen again and again and again and again of issues can be got at by this type of ball. But Dublin will have the same that, evidence that, on other teams. What? Dublin will have the exact same evidence on so other what, teams. But at least, but like you're you're closing the gap, so Dublin can use their their evidence. But suddenly their issues have like, been at least tested. The reality is Dublin will probably improve in that system. Yeah, it'll just make everything else better. They got more depth as well. Better. It'll make everything else better. Like all you got to do is look, and actually, I actually hadn't realised that it was that stark the difference in. Um, score difference in the league and championship, but that's remarkable. Mm. That's unbelievable. Like, kind of, I'm kind of sp- split it between two sides here. One is that if you took Dublin out of the championship, you'd have a brilliant All Ireland. But then on the other side of things, like my idea that perhaps anybody could beat anybody to an extent outside of, of one versus the rest. You look at Mead versus Leash and what you're saying from Sunday. Now I didn't see the full game; it wasn't on TV. But you're saying that that isn't exactly the sort of level that you might expect from a, an All-Ireland Championship where it's safe to got Dublin that Leash, way. Leash aren't great in reality. Like. They're in, in Division 3 playing this year. Mm. They're playing Division 3 football this year. They have, probably haven't had that many players coming through over the last couple of years. Leash aren't great. And Mead knew that they didn't have to be amazing to beat them. Mead back Carlo by 15 points, but Carlo had a lot of problems this year. Like, I don't know. With, when, with a team like Dublin... You know, I wouldn't. I'd never say take them out of the All Ireland Championship and be way better. Like Dublin are a brilliant team, but it's just if we change the structure around them, it's like we're playing 35 games to get to this stage. We're at the provincial finals now. The qualifiers after this round of games will all be very good. But it's like, why are we wasting our time getting this far? Like, and this conversation we've had so many times. It's just on on Sunday when I was cycling home from Crow Park, I got angry. I was like, that was brutal. It was just so bad. I, I didn't pay in to watch Championship football. It was like. It wasn't even league football. At least you didn't pay for public transport. You cycled home, which is uh, the positive of your excursion. <laughs> if we keep the structures the way they are right now, what year does Dublin not win a Leinster Championship? Give me a year here. Never. 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 Like, Never. Oh, like, like, no, I don't, I don't think I... The the champs the, the French champs are over and like the GA released that statement with their but football like that, review committee. My point here is that that means that there is obviously something fundamentally wrong with either Dublin being as one entity or the Leinster counties because that's so. So you're saying to me that Meath and Kildare will never win in All Ireland then? Well, no, they surely those Ireland two counties should have designs on winning in All Ireland. Yeah, they at some should. Point. Okay, okay. So look, I, I mean, 2025. Is there? There's a year. So it, 2025, right. We'll I, play that back to you in 2025. I think that they might randomly lose one of the next 20 Leinster Championships if things stayed the way they were, they were. But it would be like... It would be like Clare beating Kerry that year in 92. Was that 92? 92, yes. Yeah, like a complete fluke. Out of nowhere. There, I, like, I, I think you're talking about a hurling county in Clare. You're talking about Kildare and Meath. Great it's football counties. Run through the, the Dublin football camp the week of the game for them to... But no, that's that's not. I don't agree with that. I I fundamentally disagree with that because Claire. I think you're comparing Claire with me then Claire is just not just a fair example, comparison. Just an example, right? Just an example. The point is that until Claire and me get their house in order the way Monaghan and Mayo have, where everything leads towards the intercounty team and the club games are actually properly respected, so there's star league fixtures, and everybody understands this is the requirements that you have if you want to be an intercounty footballer and management and county board and playing staff, playing group are all on the same 
page when it comes to what the commitment levels are and what the work-life balances are. It's not going to happen. And we haven't, we haven't seen either of these two counties prove that they're able to do that. Kildare got close before Dublin started to roll the juggernaut. And look, uh, better judges of Dublin football than me know and say that there is not the same talent pool coming through, that there is an incredible core of all-time great players that the Dubs have at the minute, that the next group of underage footballers isn't as, as strong as that. And you've seen Kildare and me be competitive in underage football in the last half decade. So maybe there's truth in that. And maybe that next generation has a chance of, of winning games. But like... Were we saying that at the start of the five in a row? But who cares? Who cares about... Uh, who cares if, if, like, somebody wins Leinster? Like... But the, I think we know this competition. They've though. been defunct for a long time. They really have, and I think the GA have, are starting to admit that themselves. Like that statement was released, revealing the names of the people on it, and like there's some interesting names on it. Kevin O'Donovan, um, Connor Donahue from Mead is on it. You know, there's people there that have, have made changes in their own counties that are involved in this football review committee that are going to have a look at the structures. So this like, has to be the end of the. It has to be the end. That's that's how it's I, as bad I, as it's ever been. That's what I felt like. Like my dad was at um, was in Clonus for the for the Cavan game and I was like do you know what I wish I went to that like I loved to watch a Mead win but like I wish I saw a proper championship match and people might say that my, my garden's in Cavan so that's probably why I'm pretty dis- dispositioned to that but that's not the case at all I don't want to watch championship football yeah uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it you can tweet us at Off The Ball or you can comment on the stream below if you happen to be watching on Facebook or on YouTube this morning as well we should tell you that Off The Ball are heading for some winter sun and top class golf and we want you to join us the Off The Ball crew along with special guests Kevin Kilban, Kieran Donaghy Peter Laurie and more are taking on two of the best courses on the planet they're the Yas Links and the National for the first ever Off The Ball Open this November Five nights in a four-star hotel, a Peter Laurie golf clinic, gala dinner, and a world-famous off-the-ball roadshow this November 17th, 23rd in Abu Dhabi. Sign up now at offtheball.com forward slash open.